We're glad you've chosen to listen to our weekly talkback. The weekly talkback is designed to take a portion of the teaching from this week to a deeper level. You may want to listen to this week's teaching, but it isn't necessary to understand the weekly talkback. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy the weekly talkback from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is going to be the same intro for all of the upcoming weekly devotional videos. Uh, in January of 2022, we did a question and answer Sunday, and you guys submitted so many questions, there was no way that I could possibly answer them all in a Sunday service. So what we decided to do instead was answer as many as I could in that Sunday service and take the rest and make them weekly devotionals. So what you are about to see is a question submitted by members of the congregation for question and answer Sunday, but we're going to be answering these over an extended period of time. So I hope that you enjoy this weekly devotional. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. And if you have any questions about Kanoi Brethren in Christ Church, if you want to get involved in some way, shape, or form, feel free to check out our website, kanoichurch.org, or email me at nick at kanoi.org. Have a great day. Well, good morning. Glad to be with you today. Uh, I have a great question to get us started, and what I'll do is I will I'll share a little bit about the question, and then I will read the question from over here. And uh, the question comes from one of our online folks, and it's a good question, but it uses the plot of Lord of the Rings a little bit to help explain the question. So if you're not familiar, Lord of the Rings was a movie series made not too long ago, but before that it was a book series written by J.R. Tolkien. And um, and it's kind of your classic good versus evil sort of um, storybook deals with wizards and elves and hobbits and orcs and all sorts of stuff. But uh, in an interview, J.R. Tolkien, uh, who was the author, he had discussed that if Gandalf, Gandalf was sort of this wizard who was a, a force of good throughout the whole thing, pretty powerful guy. And, uh, and he said if, if Gandalf had claimed the One Ring, and the One Ring was this special ring that controlled all other sources of power, he said if Gandalf had claimed the One Ring, he would have had all of the power. And he would have, he would have ordered good to be done by his people, for his people, uh, to their benefit. But he would have ordered good to be done. Jerry Tolkien says that Sauron, who was the force of evil in this story, Sauron did claim the One Ring, and when Sauron claimed the One Ring, he commanded evil to be done. And because he commanded evil to be done, evil and good were were clearly and easily distinguishable. You could tell this is good, this is evil. He said if Gandalf had gotten the ring and he commanded good to be done, people would have begun to hate good because they were commanded to do it. Choice was removed from the equation. And so the person writes in and asks this question. They said, do Christians face the same dilemma? Um, because do we risk making good seem detestable um, because we force it onto others through laws and political force? Do we make people want to rebel against good that we're doing and ultimately turn away from God uh, because we force good onto them? Would we be better suited to try to change our country or the world through more grassroots methods? Of loving others? Should our focus ever be on changing others' beliefs and action through force of law? Well, this is a great question. Um, this sounds like one that you would have like over a campfire late at night with some good friends sort of thing. Here's what I think. I, I, I also have myself surrounded by a number of books here that I'm going to share with you that I think all add some good pieces to this conversation, uh, but I'm going to try and keep things moving. I don't think legislating morality is ever something that's going to work. Let's say that I went on a political campaign and uh, I ran for eventually president of the United States. And, uh, and then I got to my presidency and I decided, you know, what, my faith is really important to me and it should be important to all of my citizens of my country. So through executive order, I'm going to legislate that everybody follows the Ten Commandments and I'm going to legislate that they follow all these other Christian rules uh, out there. 
And if they don't, then we're going to put them in prison or they're going to be fined or, or something like that. How do you think the citizens of our country would react to that if we legislated Christianity? I don't think they'd react very well to that. That's my personal opinion. Um, I also don't think, and this is not my personal opinion, this is what I know about myself, I don't think I would react well to that. Because I don't believe in taking free choice out of the equation. That's something that's deeply ingrained into my understanding of who God is. God didn't create a bunch of little robots. God created mankind. He gave mankind free will and free choice. And that free will and free choice allows us to either follow him or not follow him. And God has bent over backwards, sent his son, his son who died on a cross, uh, his son who was resurrected after three days. He's created a community we call the church today, uh, following him in order to help bring people back into right relationship with him. God so wants us in right relationship with him. He's willing to do anything in order to to, to make that happen, but he's not willing to lobotomize us. He's not willing to take choice out of the equation. And that's what I see the legislation of morality doing. Very much like this person has asked, um, that when we force good onto others, when we force other people to follow our rules, I think we tend to see rebellion more than we see people actually following those rules. So let me, let me give you some helpful information. I think helpful information, um, and we'll go from there. This is a book called In Real Time, and it's by a man named Mike Glenn. And he's a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee. And he writes a story in here where when he's in seminary, he has to go on a ride along with a police officer. And in the midst of that ride along, they get a 911 call to respond to the street where somebody has been stabbed, unfortunately. Mike recalls waiting with the officer as an ambulance came to take away the victim and then going around with the officer as they interviewed a bunch of bystanders to get an idea as to who had committed the crime. They learn the name of the person who commits the crime. And as it turns out, it's one of the people that this officer kind of knows and knows where they run around. And so Mike, Pastor Mike and the officer begin to go kind of knock on doors of the hangouts and places that this, this person usually is at and they find him at his girlfriend's house and after a small altercation he ends up handcuffed in the back of the police car taken down to the station and they're in an interview room and the officer has to leave to get some paperwork he leaves mike with the the, the criminal the perpetrator of the crime and um the person's handcuffed mike is not in any danger don't get me wrong but the the criminal who's sitting there the, the perpetrator um is saying, why are you here? What, what, like, are you an, are you a detective? Are you another police officer? Mike's like, no. He's like, are you with the DA? No. Are you, are you federal? No, 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 no. So why are you here? And, and Mike says, well, I'm, I'm in seminary and I'm training to be a pastor and I'm doing this ride along with detective. And the, the, the accused criminal here goes, wait, you're going to be a preacher? And, and Mike says, yes, I am. And he goes, well, what kind of preacher are you going to be? And Mike says, well, I'm going to be a Baptist preacher. And the criminal looks at him and goes, no way, I'm Baptist too. And, and for Mike, like he writes that story to say, what a disconnection between what this person thinks it means to be a follower of Christ or a follower of God and what it really means. Somehow the idea of being a Baptist doesn't translate into actually following Jesus's commands for this guy it translated into kind of a name, a title, uh, almost a cultural, this is who I am, this is what my family is. When I go to church, I go to a Baptist church. Uh, and so there wasn't a faith taken seriously. It was a faith in name only. Um, so he talks about that story and um, makes me think of this other book. This is called The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis is one of the most fantastic Christian thinkers we've had in the last hundred years. And he writes this book called Screwtape Letters. And what it is, is um, it's, it's just a work of his imagination. And there's a demon writing letters to another demon about how to get Christians, how to get, how to get people not to follow God. And, and in it, 
in chapter 11, this, this, this demon says, hey, you should try and, and get your human that you've been assigned to embrace flippancy. Uh, help him to just be flippant, flippant about his faith. Like, help him just to not take it seriously. Because if you can get him to not take it seriously, then it becomes this slow step-by-step process where they think they're good. They think they're following God, but in reality, they're not following God at all because they're just flippant about their faith. It's not a serious thing for them. And, and, and you know, Mike Glenn's story in, in real time makes me think of the screw tape letters. And it makes me think of this idea that we're not taking our faith seriously often. Uh, and, 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 and seriously, when you think about it, what does it mean for you to be a Christian? If, are, are you willing to call yourself a Christian, a follower of God, and, and not actually follow him? Is it about following rules and regulations? Is it about mandating rules and regulations? Is it about something that was legislated to you at one time? A parent or a grandparent or a a guardian in your life legislated this morality, this idea of Christianity unto you. And so you have adopted all of the rules, but none of the relationship. Because that's what this question gets me to think of. You know, a legislating morality, legislating the following of God is really just all about rules and regulations, and it takes relationship right out of the equation. Relationship is absolutely essential to following Jesus. Now, I brought this other book, and uh, you may have heard of it. This is called The Five Love Languages. I use this in uh, premarital counseling all the time. And, um, and essentially, the author of this book says there are are five kinds of love languages and a love language is this when when you are feeling love when you're feeling cared for that's usually coming across in a certain kind of language so here's here's the first one the first language is words of affirmation if somebody says something nice or kind or affirms you in some sort of way does that make you feel loved or do you really just don't care too much about how what other people say you know Uh, so words of affirmation uh, language two is quality time. Quality time is is not just being together, but it's spending good quality time together. It's engaging with one another. Uh, language three is receiving gifts. So that is just what it sounds like. Somebody buys you a gift. Does that make you feel loved? Uh, language four is acts of service. Somebody doing something on your behalf. Does that make you feel cared for? And language five is physical touch. When somebody puts their hand on your shoulder, when they give you a hug, uh, when, you're, when your spouse slips their hand inside your hand and, and holds your hand, th- does that make you feel cared for? So words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical love. I bring all of that up because this author says, look, there's five different languages that exist that this is how we communicate love. Every person can be different. The point is this. If you are going to try to communicate the love of God to somebody or get somebody to at least fall in love with Jesus, do you think that the way to do that is to legislate morality, to legislate Christianity, or perhaps the way is to speak their love language? Perhaps if you want to share Jesus, we need to enter into very real relationship with people. Not legislate morality, not tell them the rules and regulations absent a relationship, but instead take a page out of the book of Jesus Christ himself, who left the throne room of heaven to put on flesh and join mankind and engage in actual, honest, real relationship with them. Because here's the thing, we tend to think of this world and our life as a game of twister. But instead of getting all twisted up and having your right hand on green and your left foot on blue and your right hand on on, on yellow, what we end up doing is, is acting rigid and straight and we stand on every dot and I'm on the red dot and there's a blue dot over there and when I'm on the red dot I act this way and then I'll jump over the blue dot and act this way and then I'll go to the yellow dot and I'll act this way and I become a different person at every color dot when in reality life is not you being a different person in every place that you're at. Life is a game of twister where you're some in the green and you're some in the red and you're some in the blue. And what you need to do and what I need to do 
is figure out how do we follow Jesus in all of those places? Because that's what it means to be in real relationship. You want to come to church sometime and you want to act your best and put on your Sunday best and follow all the right rules and, and fit in perfectly. Fine, do that. But I realize that's not who you really are. Who you really are is a broken person, just like me. A person who makes mistakes, just like me. A person who doesn't have all the answers, just like me. A person who um, may have struggled at work this week. A person who may have struggled at home this week. A person who's trying to raise children in this world. A person who's trying to care for their extended family in this world. A person who's trying to develop a spiritual faith and also maintain some of the disciplines like prayer in their life. I realize that we don't live in this rigid, siloed, red dot, blue dot, green dot world. We live in a twister world. And in a twister world, real relationship means actually entering in and figuring out how do we love one another despite the fact that we live in a twister world. And that's one of the things that I love about this book, which I'll get to in just a moment. First, I want to get to this book. This is a book called A New Kind of Christian. And one of the things that I love about this book is I read it at a time in my life when this is what I needed to be engaged on, and it was sort of a life-changing book for me. All that aside, the author Brian McLaren has some really great things to say, and here's one that he says kind of towards the end of the book. He says, I also think the standard definition of salvation breeds passivity. It's like a line in the sand, and we say, the most important thing in life is to be on the other side of this line. Okay, people cross the line, but what then? They try to get other people to cross the line. Okay, well, what then? I see a huge contrast between crossing a line in this way and following Jesus on a journey. It's as if we have taken what is for Jesus a starting line and turned it into a finish line. What he's saying is we have focused so much on getting people to obey the rules, to pray the right prayer and say the right words, to follow Jesus, that we've missed the fact that following Jesus isn't about this one moment. It's not about crossing a line. It's about a journey and a lifetime of following him. Following him is the starting line for Jesus. If we look at the Gospels and we see Jesus go to the fishermen, what's the first thing he says to the fishermen? Come and follow me. That is the beginning of their relationship and their time of ministry with Jesus. And yet, come and follow me, our response to that, yes, I will follow you. We have made that the finish line. We send our kids to church camp and Sunday school. We do revival meetings. We have the greatest conferences that are out there, all designed to get people to cross that line of, yes, I will follow Jesus. When, when that seems like the finish line to us, but in reality to Jesus, that was a starting place. That's where we begin. See, there's this whole big, long journey ahead of us. It's not just about following the rules and regulation. It certainly isn't about having morality legislated to you. It's about saying, yes, I'll follow Jesus. And then we have a whole community of people who've entered into a relationship with us who are willing to speak our language to engage us and help us begin to take our faith seriously beyond just I follow Jesus. And now I will follow Jesus with my whole life, with every step. We need people who will come around us and guide us and direct us and hold us accountable and, and put our arms around us as we follow Jesus over a lifetime, not just a moment. But here's the thing. We give in to something. Um, and it's, it's, there's this chapter in this book. This book is called Practicing the Presence of People. And if you really want a good book that talks about how do you really engage on a long journey with somebody, the one we're talking about this morning, this book's for you. But at the very back of this book is a chapter called Fear of Man. And the author says this, fear tends to manifest itself in one of two ways, either in the domination and control of others, or else in the need to impress people, standing in their shadow and letting them pull our strings. Either way is the result not a friendship, but alienation. 
I appreciate that because he says fear of man leads to one of two things. Either you're a puppet or you're someone who exerts dominion over others. You force others. You legislate others. Here's the thing. End of, end of the day, here's, here's the thing. Can we legislate morality and expect people to buy into it in a genuine way? No. Maybe people will follow that legislation because they're scared to step outside of it. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be heart change. Heart change is going to come from relationship, real relationship with people. It's not going to come from dominion. It's going to come from engaging them and loving them, not in the way that you are always the most comfortable in loving them, but in loving them in the way that they are comfortable being loved, that they receive love, that they understand what love is. And it's walking with them over a lifetime of journeying after Jesus, of not going, you know what, I don't really care about this. I'm going to take this whole faith thing flippantly, of not letting them believe that being a Baptist or a Christian or whatever is just some name that you get to put on whenever you feel like it. Because guys, we are a whole new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So let us not, let us not ever choose rule and regulation absent of relationship. May we always choose relationship and allow that to lovingly guide us in any rules and regulations we encounter. I hope you have a wonderful day. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.